Bitcoin confirming the bearish trend by falling nearly 6.63% over the past week. On this daily chart, Bitcoin could not get above the 32,190 range, uh, which means that the ongoing decline is the more likely scenario. The last support before a potential sharp drop in the zone around 30K shown here in the green lines. If the bears end up breaking it, the price decrease may continue to 24,000. Welcome back to the channel, guys. Glad to have you back. And uh, please hit the like for me on the way in. Uh, Ethereum looking just as bearish as Bitcoin, validating continued downtrend with a descending triangle. The uh, 1730 level support line follows our continued sideways march and in the last support zone before the more profound decline uh, to support around 1500 if it breaks. Um, the trading volume is still low. However, we are seeing an attempt by the bulls to break this trend. Can the bulls pull it off? While it is still too early to tell, the overall markets are seeing some buying pressure. Uh, Cardano still holding strong at its support level around dollar nineteen. Uh, v chain coming in at around six point seven cents, uh, finding support um, at that lower line there. Um, the DXY, the Dixie's looking really strong right now, uh, retesting that the upward uh, trend line. Uh, looking at it at the higher time frames, we can see that. Uh, the Dixie has been sort of in this uh, this downtrend, uh, testing this support line once again. Uh, we have been unable to break this trend, luckily for Bitcoin. So hopefully, uh, you know, we will see further resistance here. Um, some downward momentum on the Dixie might give uh, Bitcoin and the rest of rest of the crypto markets an opportunity to um, regain their foothold so yeah that's the markets for today uh, not a whole lot to talk about as far as the charts go we're just sort of waiting uh, here to kind of see which which direction we're gonna go in uh, we are continuing to get squeezed in those markets so um, you know, just be careful out there if you're making investments, if you're accumulating, I would say uh, DCA, uh, dollar cost average uh, over time and kind of, you know, feel it out each day, see how it's going, check your momentum, check in with this channel. We will keep you, keep you guys updated on essential uh, news and fundamentals, as well as, uh, you know, some technical analysis to keep you guys informed of, uh, uh, you know, which direction we might be breaking in. Uh, so yeah, so the U.S. Treasury Secretary uh, Yellen has been yelling. Uh, U.S. Treasury Tre Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will convene a meeting with the Biden administration. Apparently, uh, he has a working group on financial markets to discuss the future of stablecoin regulations. So yeah, so apparently, in a recent comment on Friday. Miss Janet said that in light of the rapid growth in digital assets, it is important for the agencies to collaborate on the regulation of this sector and the development of any recommendations for new authorities. Uh, unsure of what that means, uh, you know, maybe there there will be some uh, a government agency taking on some tasks for further research. 
apparently the meeting is set to be held on July 19th. Um, and in attendance will be uh, Biden's so-called working group on financial markets or the PWG. Also in attendance at the meeting will be two other government agencies who have been zeroed in on crypto regulations, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, the OCC, and the uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC. So very interesting combination there. The discussion will apparently build on the PWG's a uh, statement on key regulatory and supervisory issues relevant to certain stable coins that was first published in December of 2020. Yellen's battle cry kicked off Friday's meeting, summing up her position on stable coins. She said, bringing together regulators will enable us to assess the potential benefits of stable coins while mitigating risks they could pose to users, markets, and the financial system. Despite growing opposition from financial markets, Yellen was practically yelling when she said, in light of the rapid growth in digital assets, it is important for the agencies to collaborate on the regulation of this sector and the development of any recommendations for new authorities. So according to the announcement, the PWG work group was established to um, enhance the integrity, efficiency, and competitiveness of the U.S. financial markets. Members of the PW PWG are Janet Yellen, along with the chairman of the board of governors of the federal reserve system the uh also the chairman of the sec and the acting chairman of the commodity futures trading commission or the cftc so i did read the statement on regulatory and supervisory issues relevant to certain stable coins document and uh one thing that sums up its intentions is where it states that um Depending on its design and other factors, a stablecoin may constitute a security, commodity, or derivative subject to the U.S. federal securities, commodity, and or derivatives laws. So that's pretty concerning. It further stresses that stablecoin participants and arrangements must meet all applicable anti-money laundering and counterfeiting um, financing of terrorism and sanctions obligations before bringing products to the market. Uh, yeah. So, um, the treasury's announcement also adds that the PWG will examine the current, um, regulation of stable coins, identify risks and develop recommendations for addressing those risks. Uh, the PWG expects to issue written recommendations in the coming months. So yeah, so Janet Yellen uh, really, really focused on uh, cryptocurrencies at the moment, you know, and, and there's just um, a lot of fear about, you know, I, I, I understand terror, you know, counterfeit anti-counterfeiting and terrorism and all you know and all the reasons why we need regulations like i get that you know uh but um there's definitely something else there um there's there's reasons why and we're gonna get to those right towards the end of the video i am gonna point out i'm gonna show you guys exactly why that is like why are, why is the government so focused on stable coins um before we're just gonna kind of take a breeze through some of the news in the markets things you guys uh definitely will need to know so um jack dorsey announced earlier this week that square incorporated is building a new open source platform uh for non-custodial bitcoin services um yeah so ave founder stanny akulichoff told his 90,000 Twitter followers on Saturday that his platform should build Twitter on Ethereum after Jack Dorsey said he was developing a new Bitcoin-centric financial services platform with striking similarities to Aave. Yeah, in the Twitter post we see right here, 
Stanny tweeted, um, you know, since Jack is going to build Ave on Bitcoin, Ave should build Twitter on Ethereum. And, uh, you know, this tweet is in response to a tweet earlier uh, in the week, uh, last week, where Dorsey tweeted on Thursday that Square Inc., his mobile payment company, was creating a new business focused on building an open developer platform with the sole goal of making it easy to create non-custodial permissionless and decentralized financial services. Uh, in, in the tweet, apparently, um, Dorsey wrote that Square is creating a new business, uh, joining seller, cash app, and title, focused on building an open developer platform with the sole goal of making it easier to create non blah, blah, blah. So you guys see the tweet right there. Uh, so yeah, I, I would really like to hear what you guys think about all this. The tweet has received over 34,000 likes uh, so far. And as far as I can tell, it appears that Bitcoin would be the primary focus of the, uh, of, of the initiative. Uh, as many of you guys know, it's been a long time since Bitcoin has seen any development in, and um, based on historical experiences with making changes on the Bitcoin platform, uh, it usually takes a considerable amount of time to get these projects off the ground. Uh, what is interesting about all this is that uh, there are many other DeFi protocols that could best be used for a project like this. And um, while I respect Dorsey's support for development on Bitcoin, it seems like DeFi may be the better play. I don't know. I don't know what you guys think about that. In Kulichev's response to Dorsey, he implied that Dorsey's business idea is similar to Aave, an open source non-custodial DeFi protocol that enables users to borrow assets and, and earn interest on deposits. While it's not entirely clear whether Kulichov's Twitter on Ethereum plan is serious, he said Ave co-founder Jordan Lazaro Gustav uh, would uh, would lead the effort. So yeah, so we will have to see about this one. I, I am interested in hearing more uh, from you about this. And if you would like to see Twitter move to Bitcoin or do you think it would be a better play on Ethereum or Ethereum DeFi protocols like Ave. Obviously, uh, an alternative concern that I have is Ethereum transaction fees. You know, I, I just the other day I tried to send um, a half ETH, you know, a 0.5 ETH, and the fees were outrageous. It cost well over seventy-five dollars just to send some ETH from an exchange to a wallet. I don't know. Maybe the fifteen fifty-nine protocol update will help but as of right now uh well let's just say it's a platform that only the wealthy can use at the moment uh in the nft space i, I wanted to um uh share this with you guys so um you know especially speaking of social media sites on blockchain this article just printed about 10 minutes ago. The inaugural kickoff of Nifty's social NFT platform took a new wave of excitement on Monday. Uh, this unusual wave came from announcing Warner Brothers as the principal collaborator with Nifty's Inc. There's also a backup seed investment worth about $10 million from some very big venture firms uh, in the blockchain. So the partnership uh, with Warner Brothers influences Nifty's to launch a collection of NFT uh, limited edition. According to the company's announcement, the collection will feature characters from Space Jam, a new legacies, uh, a new like uh, Space Jam, a new legacy, a future movie. Consensus, uh, the Ethereum software company, developed the NFT for Space Jam using Palm NFT Studio technology. Um, so in my experience, the best, me best method for evaluating, predicting the future performance of a new asset is to follow the money. Approximately $10 million have been allocated to the new project from these investors and the distribution of those funds made its way on Friday. Other investors include Coinbase Ventures, AT&T Capital Ventures, Forerunner Ventures, Tops, like the baseball card, Tops, Dapper Labs, Liberty City Ventures, and Henny. In addition, some pre-seed investors supported Nifty's platform launch by topping their stake in Nifty's. 
Some of the pre-seed investors include Draper Dragon Fund, Ethereal Ventures, and Polychain Capital. The executive vice president at Samsung, uh, David Lee, through his speech, praised and publicized Nifty's innovation in NFT confinement. So this seems like a very well-backed NFT project, um, but with the current market conditions, hopefully they will be able to revive investor interest back into the markets. Um, so yeah, um, I, I did want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, NFTs and their valuations. So, you know, we've seen at the beginning of the year, we saw a lot of NFTs selling for big, big money, right? Big dough, big dough. And while a lot of those valuations of NFT, of the NFT market became a hot topic, uh, it really heated up when uh, digital artist people sold an NFT for almost $70 million earlier this year. The high price for the sale of that NFT led to a difficult question for many accountants. And um, how these assets were taxed is a big question many tax specialists are wrestling with these days. Um, you know, like what is an NFT value when, it, when it's on a company balance sheet or held in an individual's collection or even um, when it's in the possession of a digital artist and ready for sale? As with many emergency, emerging di digital asset classes, the answers to these questions are not very easy to figure out. Um, as we all know, the, the market for NFTs is a rel relatively new and growing. Um, and in March, a blockchain investor uh, bought a file of a digital collage by Beeple at a Christie's auction for more than $69 million dollars the first digital NFT artwork sold by a major auction house. And the apparently it was like the third highest price ever reached for a work by a living artist. So quite amazing prices on these things. And um, the reason for the popularity of NFTs is that they give artists and creators a way to confirm their rights uh, to ensure their NFTs will be used or exploited only in the manner they set forth and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but questions have been raised about the high prices of certain NFTs because it seems the image could be copied from a public website um, and used without paying for it. Um, so, but, you know, obviously like having unique rights to the asset seems to drive the market and the value for NFTs basically, right? And so most of the time investors buy NFTs for the, you know, a sentimental value or reasons and, um, or as an investment, right? It's going to increase in value, but I think it is important to discuss these investments on this channel because with all of the hype in the space around NFTs, it's hard to predict how the NFT market will be in three to five years. And as most of you know, by now, uh, this channel supports long-term investments in well researched digital asset products. NFTs are more challenging to predict in the long term, and I believe that is a good reason uh, for us to discuss them here. Um, and, you know, because of their nature and relatively new use, valuation of NFTs is an evolving and challenging area. Um, what makes NFTs popular also makes their valuation more difficult. And um, value is based on basically on the perceptions of owners and buyers uh, or scarcity, you know, how well you can access the NFT um, and the distribution channel all, also matters, right? So like you got like these apps that are easy to use like Vivi, um, but even with Vivi, you know, where every asset was like sold out in like a day, things have sort of slowed down recently. Um, you know, and there's, there's really no physical limitations on NFTs, uh, and they have broader, you know, visibility and liquidity because they be, they can be accessed and distributed across a global landscape in an instant, you know, and, um, there are different valuation considerations, um, at, you know, whether you're the creator purchaser or owner of the NFT at the beginning of the of its existence and uh, on an ongoing basis, right? As these assets are included on 
balance sheets and subject to financial statement audits. So at the time of its creation, the value of an NFT may be dependent um, uh, you know, on the, on the characteristics of its creator, basically, and the NFT itself, among other things. Take, for example, um, how the broader marketability or the recognition of a certain celebrity artist might affect the value of their NFT. Um, you know, basically what this means is that there is a highly specul speculative social influence on the value of that digital asset. Um, that is until the NFT is actually sold, right? So once the asset is sold, its value becomes influenced by the sale of that price, um, especially for tax purposes, right? So you buy an NFT for $69 million. Um, and then, you know, three months later, that person is no longer a celebrity, right? They're seen on the news and they're, you know, uh, charged with rape or some, some crazy stuff like that. And, and next, you know, no one wants anything to do with that person. You're paying taxes on the $69 million asset but the thing ain't worth crap, right? And so th these are important considerations when investing in NFTs, right? The resale value of that asset might actually be much lower than its taxable value. Um, so yeah, it's a major concern for investors speculating on these new assets. And uh, the value of an NFT um, is based on a third party transaction between a willing buyer and a seller. And if the investor is using cryptocurrency that is actively traded to buy the NFT, uh, the value of that asset is determined by the value of the cryptocurrency used in the transaction. And at the time of the transaction, since that digital asset was used to buy the NFT has a more readily ascertainable fair market value. So, yeah, so, you know, and so this article basically, so according to uh, David Larson, a certified CPA and managing director of the alternative asset advisory practice at Duffs and Phelps, he said that none of the basic metrics you would use to value private companies or traditional investment vehicles like shares or warrants are available for NFTs. He goes on to say that uh, for an NFT, for an NFT, what the last buyer paid for it gives you an indication of what the value is, but the next buyer could pay something else, and it is the amount the next buyer will pay that determines the value. Um, and so Larson notes it is not easy to ascertain who will who the next buyer will be, or to obtain information on on why they would pay what they would pay. Values can fluctuate based on perceptions over time. If an NFT for art was trading and its price went up, so the value increased, uh, but then potential buyers decided at a point in time they can look at the digital image on their phones or computers for free and there are no new buyers, does that mean that the NFT value is now zero? So yeah, so it's just, a, just an interesting um consideration when you know if you are in the nft space and you're buying nfts um you know, just just something to consider uh i will continue to research this phenomena uh and continue to bring you the information that you need to make good investment decisions uh, this content is always free and only costs uh one like so please support the channel by hitting the like button and um subscribing to the channel your support helps get this information out to other crypto investors who could also benefit from hearing it. So I'd appreciate it if you guys can hit the like for me. Um, all right. So last up on the list for today. So this is very important information. And, um, you know, in the last story, of this is the last story of the video. And, I, you know, I want to present some very important information that you, the crypto investor, needs to know about regarding the Fed interest rates and the economy right we hear a lot of stuff coming out in the media about you know the fed interest rates and the economy and stimulus and inflation and like how are all these things going to like impact the market right and and so this is very important information that you know if you if you're new to the to monetary policy bear with me 
I will try my best to make this as easily digestible as possible. Uh, as in any other emerging markets, crypto investments are risk on assets that can become highly volatile and can be irrevocably swayed by investor sentiment. Um, especially now that we have more institutional investors in the space than ever before uh, who understand the economy, right? They understand emerging markets and they understand how inflation is going to impact emerging markets, right? And so, um, you know, it's kind of like an egg before the chicken type thing, right? Like, is it the investors speculating on what the Fed is going to do or is it the Fed doing something and then the investors responding? It, it's hard to tell and no one knows, but who cares? At the end of the day, we just need to be able to play the game better than the whales, right? And that's the whole game, right? That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to gain money, right? We're trying to take money from other investors. I mean, that is what investing is. And uh, the whales are very good at this game, right? And so they predict how the market sentiment is going to move, how it's going to change before it happens. And so that is what we're talking about here today. And um, I just wanted to bring this up. I want you guys to be aware of this because I think it's really important when you're investing in risk on assets like crypto, you need to understand what is going to happen in the market in the next two months, one month, five months, year from now. You need to understand when you're making investments what the market is going to do. And so bear with me. So Mark Mobius uh, is a renowned emerging markets investor and co-founder of Mobius Capital Partners. So according to this article, he believes that upcoming actions from the Federal Reserve could drag down the crypto mark the cryptocurrency market even further than they already are so i'm just going to get into this just a little bit and i i just want you guys to bear with me and and, and try to follow me here because it's, it's really important okay um in an interview with kitco news mobius says he expects financial markets particularly cryptocurrencies to drop if the federal reserve decides to rapidly taper asset purchases so this is what he has to say okay he says they they actually are doing a little bit of tapering in any case but if it's done rapidly and suddenly then you could have a real tantrum okay it could have the markets affected dramatically because people will then be looking for the finance but it's not there the money will not be available he says, I think you're going to see when that happens, the cryptocurrencies will be hit badly and that will affect the psychology of many, many people, particularly young people who invested a lot of money in cryptocurrencies. And then, of course, you'll see a decline in the stock market. So he spoke about a tantrum and I would like to share some very important information with you about quantitative easing and a potential tantrum effect that can take place in the very near future. This may seem, you know, a little boring to you, but trust me, as an investor, you need to know this as it will play an important part of your investment decisions. The investor adds that the crypto asset class, let me just come down here a little bit. So he, he says that, um, the crypto asset class will most likely be the first domino to fall once the Federal Reserve begins tapering and uh, fiscal stimulus dries out, right? So he says, in order for these cryptocurrencies to maintain their value, they need to they need more inputs of money. In other words, uh, you've got to have more people coming in and believing these cryptocurrencies will go up in value. Of course, you have the same thing with the stock market, but cryptocurrencies are particularly more vulnerable to a shortage of extra cash, right? Um, so I wanted to, to, to look a little bit deeper into this with you all today here on this video, because this information is very relevant to investing. If you are a professional investment manager and, uh, then you already probably are, you already know this, right? 
but I wanted to break this down a little for all those who might not have had prior experience with economic influences on financial markets. So if you have been in crypto for some time, then you know that taper talk or rate hike expectations tend to lift yields on U.S. treasuries, right? Making the dollar more attractive and weakening demand for assets like gold and Bitcoin. For example, the 2013 taper tantrum prompted a decline in gold and emerging, emerging market currencies, right? Another example was back in 2020. In response to the economic impact of COVID-19 pandemic, the Federal Reserve cut short-term interest rates to zero on what day? March 15th, 2020, and restarted its large-scale asset purchases, more commonly known as quantitative easing. If you don't know how this impacted digital assets, please go back and look at the crypto, the crypto charts from March 15th, 2020. We had a huge dump, right? Lower than I think we've ever gone before, right? All right. So since then, uh, I think it was uh, beginning in July 2020, the um, the Fed has been buying eighty, you know, about eighty billion dollars of Treasury securities and around forty billion dollars of agency mortgage-backed securities or MBSs each month okay that they're spending that each month however as the economy rebounded uh this year in mid 2021 fed officials began talking about slowing or tapering the pace of its bond purchases right so the fed has been lifting their foot off the gas on boosting up the economy the Fed boosts the economy by buying long-term debt securities, and this is called quantitative easing. And then when the economy has gotten back to, uh, you know, to a point where they feel like it's good again, they start to ease up on that buying. So, yeah, so it's all, it's all based on this article right here, this, this research art, this research paper, uh, a portfolio model of quantitative easing by Jens H.G. Christensen from the, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Um, so yeah, so um, so that's what I want. I just want to I just want to bear with me here because this is important for you guys to know. So basically, quantitative easing helps the economy by reducing long-term interest rates, right? making business and mortgage borrowing much cheaper. And, um, and, and what it also does is it signals the Fed's intention to keep using monetary policy to support the economy, right? So people know when they hear that they're going to ease up on quantitative, quantitative easing, they know that's a signal from the Fed, right? Um, and the Fed turns to quantitative easing when short-term interest rates fall nearly to zero, and the but the economy still needs help, right? So by ha by buying U.S. government debt and mortgage-backed securities, the Fed reduces the supply of these bonds in the broader market. Private investors who desire to hold these securities will then bid up the prices of the remaining supply lowering their yield. This is called the portfolio balance effect. That's that paper we just I just showed you. This mess this mechanism is particularly important when the Fed purchases long-term securities during periods of crisis. Even when short-term rates have fallen to zero, long-term rates often remain above this effective lower bound, providing more space for purchases to stimulate the economy. Okay? So it's important to realize, okay, that lower treasury yields are a benchmark for other private sector interest rates, such as corporate bonds and mortgages. With low rates, households are more likely to take out a mortgage or car loans or whatever you need to buy, furniture, right? And businesses are more likely to invest in things like equipment and hiring workers, right? And stuff like that. 
Lower interest rates are also associated with higher asset prices, increasing the wealth of households and thus driving spending, right? To stimulate the economy. Okay, so it's all related, right? These are economics, right? It's all tied in together. So investors, so like, you know, money managers, right? They know this stuff. They understand, you know, how federal money policy, monetary policy is going to impact the markets. They, so they know this, okay? And so you being an on chainian on this channel, you are going to know this stuff too, right? And you're going to be able to use this in your investment decisions and you're going to be able to say, hey, I think I want to maybe put my money in something a little bit safer until I know what's going to happen next, right? Or you could say, hey, there's a little bit of extra money out there. You know, investors are going to have this extra surge of cash. So the markets are probably going to do better. So maybe I should, you know, take a little, take on a little more risk in my portfolio. Okay. So, additionally, for the investor, bond purchases can impact market expectations about the future path of monetary policy. Quantitative easing is seen as a signal from the Fed that it intends to keep interest rates low for some time. Overall, the large-scale asset purchases they took play, uh, that took place during and after the global financial crisis had powerful effects on lowering 10-year tre treasury yields. Right. So in this chart, we're looking at the treasury yields. Right. Um, and you can see here. So between, you know, all the way back from 2014 to 2020, I mean, not a lot was happening. Right. And then we had the covid pandemic. And what happened after the covid pandemic? Straight shot to, for the sky. Right, we went all the way up to eight trillion dollars. So, okay, now we see we see what the Fed has been doing since March. Right, we know we know that they're spending a shit ton of money on on these investments. Right, and so what does that mean to us? It means that taper tapering. Okay, and this is what this this article is just talking about a taper tantrum right, is when it moves really fast, okay, uh, it doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it's something that you should be aware of, that if, you know, if you hear about potential taper tantrum happening, uh, this is what it means, okay, so tapering is the gradual slowing of the pace of the Federal Reserve large-scale asset purchase. Tapering does not refer to an outright reduction of the Fed's balance sheet, Right. So they're not selling. They're not selling assets. They're just slowing down. They're buying. Right. It's a reduction in the pace of its expansion. OK. It's, it's important thing to understand. At some point after tapering is complete, the central bank is likely to gradually reduce the size of its balance sheet by letting maturity maturing securities run off the balance sheet without replacing them as it did from October 2017 until September 2019 causing this overall trended decline shown here right so we see it right here it declines all the way and so as time is going on these assets are falling off the Fed's balance sheet right boom down to practically nothing so basically, the Fed's motivation for tempering, tapering is to slowly remove the monetary stimulus it has been providing to the economy, right? Specifically, according to uh, the guidance the Fed issued in December, tapering will begin when the economy has made substantial further progress towards its goals. Some members of the Fed Policy Setting Committee uh, the Federal Open Market Committee, or the FOMC, have noted that employment remains far below the pre-pandemic level, suggesting that patience is needed. Other members have expressed concern about inflationary pressures and excessive risk-taking in financial markets 
as a result of the Fed's asset purchases. Okay. So what this means is that they provided all this money to the stimulus, you know, stimulus checks and, uh, you know, parents are now receiving daycare money from the Fed. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of support going on over the last few months with like stimulus money and stuff like that. And people got a lot of dough. And they're being reckless with it. And the Fed is really concerned, right? So this divide, this is this divided opinion has created heated debates about crypto regulations, especially around stable coins. Okay. Because one thing that the Fed doesn't want people to do is move that money out of the economy. Right? So they pump money into the economy so that that money can bolster right the value of the u.s dollar blah 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 and what happens people start dumping that money into cryptocurrency locking it up in stable coins and taking it out of circulation from the u.s economy so the fed has made clear that tapering will precede any increase in its target for short-term interest rates um, so yeah, so tapering not only reduces the amount of quantitative easing, it also is seen as a forewarning of tighter monetary policy to come, as was observed after uh, the Great Recession, right? Um, so yeah, so um, so basically, um, so so anyway, what is this? You know, the impact of a uh, ta- taper tantrum, anyway. So fortunately for investors, the impacts of the, impacts of the last taper tantrum the, uh, on the U.S. economy were relatively mild, right? With the economy growing at a rate of 2.6% in 2013, uh, despite fiscal as well as monetary tightening. Uh, but it did have greater effects on financial markets abroad when the increase in treasury yields drove capital outflows and currency depreciations, right? Especially in emerging markets. Uh, so in essence, tapering can impact long-term interest rates through both its direct effects on bond markets and uh, the signal it provides about the Fed's future policy intentions. Uh, so yeah, but anyway, so this article is a is in response to that, right? So a taper tantrum. So when you guys see this stuff in the news, right, this is what it means. Um uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys know know about this stuff, but I, I just, you know, for those new investors out there who might not understand what this even means and how does it impact cryptocurrency, I just wanted to go through this really quickly, okay? It's not everything. It's just the main points, but... So, basically, this guy here is saying that um, he's from Skybridge Capital, um, and basically, he's saying that... Um, this, this article discusses the potential resiliency of crypto markets in the event of a taper tantrum. According to Skybridge Capital, a $7.5 billion hedge fund, fiat currency alternatives like Bitcoin and all coins are likely to remain resilient, even if the U.S. Federal Reserve curtails its liquidity boosting quantitative easing program. All fiat currency alternatives, which have gone uh, through fairly recent substantial corrections, are in a much better place now to handle that eventual taper and gradual slowing of money supply growth uh, than they were as uh, they were making higher highs and, uh, you know, higher high upon higher highs. So that is uh, Troy Gajewski, co-chief investment officer and senior portfolio manager at Skybridge Capital we can see by this parabolic increase in spending since March 15th, 2020, um, that we are going to see a pullback. And if this pullback comes back down to, you know, three, four trillion dollars, um, that's going to re- greatly reduce the money supply. Okay. And that means that Uh, Less money supply uh, means less extra cash people have on hand, okay? So the less people, uh, less cash people have on hand, the less money they're going to be investing. Um, But this guy thinks that it's not going to really impact us that bad. 
because he believes that people are going to look to Bitcoin and altcoins to protect themselves against inflation. So that even though cryptocurrencies are a risk on assets in an emerging, emerging uh, market, technological market, technology market, that it's not going to be impacted like other emergency, emerging markets because of its potential store of value. Okay. So something to keep in mind. Um, you know, as you're navigating these types of articles and, you know, you're, you're seeing this information, these are important considerations as an investor, okay, and the risks that you take and how you balance your portfolio. So just keep that stuff in mind, guys, okay? And, uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. U.S. dollar looks like it's trying to break that trend line, but it just, hopefully we'll see some, we'll see, a you know, a bounce back down here, okay? Um, and then, you know, hopefully we, hopefully Bitcoin can, um, continue to find support. looks like we're finding support here. Um, definitely hitting right on that support line. So, um, you know, hopefully we can get back up there and get back into the groove. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Take care, be easy and uh, be safe out there in the markets. Don't buy more than you can risk to lose.